All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are. Ha I'm happy to have with us today, uh, Dr. Rachel Starr, and let's picture back up here again, real quick. Um, and we're going to be talking about some case studies and results that she's had with NRT uh, with animals. Uh, Dr. Starr, thank you so much for uh, joining us this afternoon, um, taking time out of your extraordinarily busy schedule between two offices. <laughs> Hi, Adam. So um, if you could just give us a, a quick background on your practice um, or practices, I should say, because you're you practice at two different offices, correct? I, I do, but they're owned by the same the same company. Um, I do almost exclusively nutrition at this point. I do still have some clients from before I went into nutrition who do um, still request me for annual physical exams and whatnot, and we fit them in. But um, I'm supposed to work from from 8:30 a.m. until one, and right now I'm I'm working from eight until about three or four because I can't get in all of my patients in the time that I want to work. So, <laughs> and, and I would say 90% of what I do is nutrition response testing. Awesome. And uh, recently you and I were actually at the, uh, see if I can get the acronym correctly, the AHVMA uh, yes. conference down in uh, West Palm Beach. And, um, huge, huge response to the holistic vets there wanting to get tested by you and uh, actually learn more about this. So we asked you to do this webinar today and we actually wanted to go over some, uh, we have four case studies that uh, you did um, in practice. So I'm gonna bring up a PowerPoint here real quick. Uh, yeah. and I'm gonna turn the show over to you and Guys, okay. just a reminder, this is an interactive webinar. If you have any questions for Dr. Rachel, type them in. I'll make sure that they get asked. And um, yeah, let's have some fun with this. All right. So uh, can you see the uh, PowerPoint, Dr. Rachel? I can. All right. So um, <laughs> that's me I, and Pop. That, that's <laughs> Puck, yes, um, he's yours, correct? He is, yes. Yeah. And he is um, my second dog that I have had that has started uh, raw from the beginning and who has been a nutrition response testing puppy who has been tested since I got him as a puppy. And, and how he old has is no health problems. He's <laughs> four, he's four years old. Awesome. But I have a 10 year old too, um, who was a nutrition response testing, and maybe not puppy, but um, early on in her life. And she is 10 now with no health problems. Awesome. Well, Gracie, oh, so Gracie the Schnauzer is, um, I'm actually working on writing Gracie up for uh, the journal for um, AHVMA, for American Holistic Vet Med Association. Um, because we had such extensive records on her, she um, came into our clinic and was presented to one of my colleagues in June of 2017. She had had two cystotomies for bladder stones. Um, the first one had been done before the owner moved to this area, and she was on Royal Canaan SO, which is a stone dissolving diet. Um, when she came to us, but had been for a couple of years. And she had presented for a second cystotomy at when once the owner moved into our area at our local emergency clinic, and I had all of those records. Um, and she had obstructed with urinary stones in the urethra and they had performed the second cystotomy was an emergency procedure for her. And that was done in, um, the fall of, I believe in September of 2016. So mm -hmm. she came to us in June of 2017 and she already had bladder stones again. Um, the vet who took her in did and had been on a stone dissolving diet the whole time. So 
the vet took her in and um, did an ultrasound on her and looked at stones and um, and she had stones at that time. She also had high liver enzymes and she looked at the liver and then did ultrasounds on her periodically because the owner did not want to pursue another surgery in this dog. Um, so in the, the dog was not symptomatic. The, the owner said that the dog felt fine and was not having issues. She could urinate. So she didn't pursue another treatment or, or another surgery. And mm -hmm. until, so then she was seen again the following year for an annual physical exam after they had tried to dissolve those stones for about six months. Um, and they had done follow-up ultrasounds. And when she was seen at her annual physical exam the following year, she had palpable stones in the bladder. Feels like a, a, a bag of marbles. And the radiographs were taken at that time. And I, I believe the radiographs are on the next slide, right, Adam? If yes. We can go to the next slide if you... So the one on the far left is, um, you can see, it's on the far right of the radiograph, but there's um, white, kind of more dense. Those are stones in the bladder of this dog. Um, can I can I can I point? It does it. It won't show on my. Uh, I don't think it will, but. Okay. Do you see yeah, you got it. Yep, right, right there. 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 Adam can know. Um, so those are the, those are the stones. So she was placed. She also had issues with hyperlipidemia, and she had gone on and off of stone dissolving diets and with consult to internist she had gone on to some low fat diets low fat id from hills to try to get rid of her hyperlipidemia but at this point the stones were much bigger and she was on actually she'd been switched from the royal canin so since it wasn't working to hills cd multicare so a different stone dissolving diet um, but clearly that was not working either. So she came back um, a, a month later to recheck and she mm -hmm. still has stones. That's the radiograph in the middle. Um, so she still has stones, stones right in the there. bladder, right? But now also, if you go to the other side, she had stones in the gallbladder. So Adam, if you come to the other side of the x-ray, um, right behind the ribs on the bottom, go down into the left 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 right behind the rib right there okay so those are <laughs> gallstones so now she also had gallstones and this was verified by ultrasound too so she had gallstones and bladder stones at this point so she was it was recommended to the owner that she be sent to a referral institution because we do not do um cholecystectomies in our clinic. We we won't we don't remove gallbladders in our clinic. We were willing to do the cystotomy, but not um, resect a gallbladder. And the owner at that point said to my colleague that she did not want to pursue another surgery and that she was going to pursue alternative therapies for the dog. Mm -hmm. At which point the the vet in my clinic said, oh we have somebody who does that. And she was sent to me a week later, two weeks later, I think. So we started to do, we started her, we did nutrition response testing on her. But the first thing that I did was I put her on a homemade raw food diet or whole foods diet. And I balanced her, her macronutrients for more fat and protein and less carbohydrates. So that was step one was to change her base diet. And remember, she was put on low-fat diets and then developed gallstones because gallstones are usually cholesterol. So okay. um, she had really high triglycerides and really high cholesterol levels, like 1,500 high. And so wow. then, then we moved um, to doing nutrition response testing. With nutrition response testing, we found that she had some underlying chemical issues in her body. And we did a homeopathic detox on her. She tested for a, home, a homeopathic detox and, and she had some food sensitivities and we started enzymes to combat her food sensitivities. And um, over the next 
So this dog came back in two weeks later and the owner told me that she had a lot more energy. She was perkier, she felt better. Um, and that no matter what happened, she wasn't pursuing other therapy because her dog felt better. So unfortunately, I don't have follow-up blood work because this owner told me that she wouldn't pursue anything else and therefore she wasn't doing that those diagnostics anymore. Gotcha. So then um, I waited about three months. We had her on supplements. She did test for some liver. She had high liver enzymes. She tested for liver supplements over time too. And she she did detox when, when she wasn't testing for the chemicals anymore. And she um, was basically, she tested for some supplements for, for dissolving stones. And then we retook x-rays in um, November. And that so, would be the slide. Yes, which was about three months after we started um, nutrition response testing on her. And she no longer had stones in the bladder. As you can see, the, the, the radiolucencies are no longer in the bladder. Yeah. Um, back further, right in front of the pelvis, yep, right there. And then, um, and she no longer had gallstones either. So it's those radio in the gallbladder area are also gone, right? So, um, so question so for you, Dr. Yeah. Rachel, uh, yeah. before you continue on. Um, you're talking a lot about um, handling the diet of uh, Gracie, <laughs> even before you got to nutrition response testing. Correct. Do you think you're, uh, and, and this was one of the questions that came in. Do you think your results would have been the same or similar had you not worked on handling the diet before you um, got her onto a nutrition response testing program? So I think the base diet is always important in that it always plays a role in, in your um, results. But but. When we get into a couple of other case studies, I wasn't able to change the diet on them. And we will go through one where it wasn't important because we got results anyway. And we will go through one where it was the most important thing. We had to change the diet before we got results. So in Gracie, we the owner was very open to doing both of those things. So, you know, I think that both of those things are important. I think we had to keep her, we had to, the base diet took away the conditions under which she made stones. So we had to correct the underlying problem that was making her create stones. And then we needed the supplements to get rid of them. So, gotcha. so I think that both of those things are very important. And, and I won't prioritize either one of them. I think they're both important. And, and okay. I think they both led to the result. And one other question on this. Um, you were saying one of the things that you were handling um, with nutrition response testing was a chemical toxicity. Yes. Uh, how likely is it that the chemical toxicity came from a, from it like a commercial dry food or kibble that she may have been being fed? <laughs> well, what she tested for was asbestos and um, alcohols. So okay. certainly, I don't know about asbestos, but alcohols as a preservative in some way may have come from a commercial diet. It could be possible. But I don't know. That's one thing I can't tell you is exactly where her chemical problems came from. But I do think sometimes they are, we do get our toxicities from the food itself. Gotcha. So oh. Gracie, Gracie was my patient. Um, until March, we went through some other things with her. Once we dissolved the stones in November, she we had some incontinence issues. We resolved her incontinence issues. Um, by the way, in this in this November um, X-ray, the owner told me that she didn't realize that her dog had been sick. She'd been saying all along that her dog was asymptomatic for stones, but at that time she said to me she's urinating much better she has a lot more energy she's feeling much better and then i saw her in march um the last time i saw her was in march of the following year of 2018 and mm -hmm. um the owner told me that 
the dog felt better than it had in years and she hadn't realized how poorly her dog felt um and then ironically two days later she was euthanized uh for cancer so the owner told me that her dog felt as good as it had felt in years when the dog had cancer gotcha a couple of the questions she, came in one from, uh, and and right. was x-rayed and she had a tumor in the abdomen at that point wow um a couple of questions came in uh one from cameron so dr cameron <laughs> with us uh, Hi, cameron. Asked, uh what type of water was this pet drinking um, she was drinking the water from the house, but she had lived in multiple locations. She, this, this dog had had stones for years and the owner had moved several times. Okay. All right. And another clear, uh, question here from Larry Blanchard. Larry, glad you're with us this afternoon. Uh, he asked, is there a source you can recommend to find out about raw diets for dogs and cats? Yes, um, I send most of my patients to a book called The Barf Diet. Barf stands for Bones and Raw Foods, or if you're more sophisticated about it, Biologically Appropriate Raw Foods. And um, it's by Ian Billinghurst. He's, um, he is an um, Australian veterinarian. Um, and that book's been on the market for a very, very long time. But he breaks down how to do a raw food diet in multiple different ways and balancing um, the macronutrients and what kind of supplements you need and all that kind of thing. Um, but there are also several websites. I mean, there's, there's a, if you Google raw foods, you're, you, you'll come up with several websites where, um, and several companies even that will be willing to balance for you. Awesome. All right. So moving on to the next case study then um, is this one. Yeah, so Winston, the Springer Spaniel. So um, Winston was, um, he came to me, was actually friends to acquaintances of mine who brought him in. I knew them in, in other areas of my life and they said that he had started to attack the other dog in his house there's another springer spaniel in his house who is a couple years older and that he would had become aggressive towards her so mm -hmm. we ran blood work and we, we talked about the possibility of thyroid disease or um, metabolic disease could affect behavior this was a change in behavior for him and um we didn't find anything abnormal um on on blood work to explain uh -huh. his behavior. So I thought that maybe this was a, a, just a behavior problem, but when I started to go into like what the symptoms of Cushing's disease was, it turned out that Winston had all of the symptoms of Cushing's disease. He was PUPD, he was polyuric, polydipsic, he was drinking and peeing excessively. Um, he was ravenously hungry. He was eating anything. And, and it turns out the fights in the household that he was attacking his housemate over involved food. So he was attacking her when there was food present. So we ran um, a low dose dex suppression test, um, which I believe is on the next slide. Is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, zoom this picture <laughs> out anymore. Okay, so, so, but you can see that the, the pre and the post, so, the post four hours was 2.0 and it does have down there that if it's if it's over 2.0 it so he was consistent for um for having pituitary a pituitary based cushing's disease hyperadrenochoricism so blood work was consistent with cushing's disease or hyperadrenocorticism and in a pituitary based um tumor so wow. can we go back to the previous slide now? Yep. Okay. So the owners were going to Hawaii for for a month and um, trilostain, which is the typical treatment for Cushing's disease, takes a lot of monitoring and you can kill them with it. 
So, so you need to make sure that you do a lot of monitoring. You start them on a low dose and then you rerun blood work and then you adjust that dose based on that blood work until you get, because if you overdose them, you, you literally are killing off parts of their adrenal glands and, and you can kill them. So I said, okay, but I have this other thing that we can do. And we did nutrition response testing on him. Um, they came back right before they left two weeks later and said that, again, chemicals and foods are what came up on him. And interestingly on him, although his pituitary came up as weak in testing, it was not the priority. And I did not have to do anything for the pituitary gland itself. I just had to detox him. So um, again, we worked with detoxing him for chemicals and we put him on, on some enzymes for food. I begged them to change his diet, but the female owner had a huge problem with um, handling raw foods and, and she would not do it. So he did not, we did not change this dog's diet. Um, it was, he was still on kibble. So the two we, in the two weeks before they went to Hawaii, they came in and said that he was better. He was doing, they thought he was doing better and they didn't want to pursue trilostane therapy because they'd read about that on the internet and, and they thought that it was toxic and they didn't want to go in that direction. Um, but that while they were gone, they could have, they could have um, their family give him the supplements. And um, so when they got back from Hawaii, um, they came in for a recheck and he was less aggressive to the, to his housemate dog and he didn't seem hungry all the time. He wasn't panting as much. Um, and, oh wait, no, that was before they went. Okay. So I next saw him in April and they said he had no problems with aggression while well, they were gone and they were happy with his progress progress and they didn't want to do anything else other than bring him in for nutrition response testing follow-ups so we did over the next few months have a couple of episodes of aggression and i did have to tweak his program um but by fall they told me they thought that he they actually told me i think ugh, in august they thought he was clinically normal but i was afraid to run blood work on him because I had never, you know, we were taught that Cushing's disease is a permanent disease and it is not curable for sure. And it's difficult to treat. And I was afraid that I was gonna run blood work and it was gonna be the same, but they were like, we're not gonna change anything anyway. They actually were very open to rechecking blood work. And you can see, so his post, um, his post, low dose sex suppression test is normal. So the first thing I did when I saw this was I went back and looked at the old results to make sure that he had Cushing's disease, um, which they say, you know, it was consistent with Cushing's disease it, as long as he has clinical symptoms associated with that. So then I went back into my notes and was looking to make sure that he had clinical symptoms because this is not, I didn't do anything to treat his Cushing's disease. Um, <laughs> all I did was detox, really all I did was detox this dog and I did a little bit of brain work on him. So um, he ended up living for five more years. I did, um, I euthanized this dog this year. Um, he had a liver tumor, but again, we didn't change the base diet on this dog. I think we could have gotten more time on him had we been able to change his base diet. Um, but I put him down at, at 12 years old, so he did live a, a full life um, of a, he had liver cancer. Wow, that's, that's just incredible. Um, just real quick, we had another question that came in here, um, and uh, perhaps something you wanna just make mental note of to uh, go over right before we end off. Um, is there, uh a layout of the dermatomes for animals um in case uh because one of our practitioners who only works on humans wants to be able to work on her own animals and so she's right. kind of wondering if you have something or 
know where she could find something to show where the different dermatomes are for uh, doing the body scan? Um, I do not have that, but they are very similar to human. And I think what we say is if you find a weakness somewhere, you can figure out what it is by the supplements that they test for. So I mean, basically you're still going to go through the stressors and find if there's a stressor on it. Um, but they are very similar. There's, there's a couple of differences. Um, obviously they're deep chested, animals are deep chested. And so the heart is in a different location than it is in a human. And the mm -hmm. heart, I actually cup the chest um, for the heart. Uh, the lungs are, are, um, are up higher in, and in a little different location than they would be on a human. Um, but okay. kidneys, adrenals. Uh, otherwise, I don't have a dermatome chart. Does UNS? <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, that we know of. No. Yeah, I've always heard the same thing in the training um, as what you were just discussing that. Um, the organ placement is actually very similar to the human body. Um, yeah. Just instead of it being upright, it's horizontal. Right. So, yeah. Um, and 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 again, if you find the weakness somewhere, you can often figure out. Like if you go, hmm, this is roughly where this would be on a human, right? You can figure out exactly what you're on. Either you know the stressors are either going to take care of it, or you can find out what it what you're on based on the supplements that they test for. Awesome. Well, we got a bunch of questions coming in before we get back to the case studies. We might have to do a part two of this to get to the other case studies. Okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Jody England uh, uh, writes in and asks, "I have a friend with a puppy who has cancer. It has a large mass over his lung. They had him on a raw diet." Um, is there ever a point that you wouldn't try NRT? Uh, and then she goes on to say, her vet has told her two months. Um, I'm assuming that's two months to uh, live, basically. Yeah, right. So my experience with cancer is that, yes, I do NRT on them for sure, but not to cure the cancer, to improve their quality of life until they die at home with their owners. I've, I've had several cancer dogs where I can keep them comfortable enough or, or we can get them to the point, um, like I've had a couple of them recently where we've been having euthanasia talks because the dog comes in and it, it just doesn't look good to me. Like they're, they're getting to be kind of skeletal. They've got a lot of, they've lost a lot of weight. They, they, they're looking bad. And I, and I say, I bring up euthanasia and the owner will tell me, well, they're still playing with the dogs, the other dogs in the house. They're still greeting us at the door when we come home. They still want to go for walks. They still, and I'm like, okay, if, if their quality of life is good, then I'm not going to push you to put them down. And then within a week, they might call me and tell me they died at home. So... Uh, my experience with cancer has not been that I can reverse cancer, but I can get them feeling good until they, the owner doesn't have to often, sometimes they still do, but um, oftentimes the owner doesn't have to make a euthanasia decision. The dog will just feel well enough to die at home. All right. Uh, next question is, are there any supplements for either dogs or cats that would be automatically contraindicated? That would be automatically contraindicated. Not in the standard process line, if, if you're using standard process supplements. I use garlic. I, I know that's probably what you're getting at, is whether or not we can use garlic in pets. And I do. If they don't test for it, I don't use it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do, when you're getting into the herbals, you might want to be more careful. But in general, if they don't test, if, if it's going to be toxic to them, they won't test for it. Um, but I use, I use a, most of the human line, or I use a lot of the human line, just as I would in humans in, in my pet patients. Awesome. Well, we've got some so, more questions. So from a, from a food standpoint, mm -hmm. um, you, you do not want to use grapes and onions in dogs. So, so grapes and onions have the potential to be toxic to dogs. 
I have people ask me about other things that they've heard are toxic, like avocados or whatnot. That's just diarrhea. It's it's not death, but grapes, grapes and onions are are toxic. Can be deadly toxic to to dogs. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to keep going with the questions. I hope you don't mind because there's some really good questions coming. Yeah, through. go ahead. So, all right, um, Dr. Cameron writes back and said, did they put the dog on trilostane? I can't pronounce that. Trilostane. No, we did not put the dog, no, we did not treat the Cushing's disease at all. Okay, cool. Yeah, he said he, uh, he missed that slide, so. No, there were right. no drugs. Um, there were no drugs involved on that dog ever. Awesome. And then the last question that we have for the moment is, have you helped a dog with chronic kidney disease uh, where the underlying cause was Lyme? If yes, what do you recommend? Okay. I have not done nutrition response testing on a dog with kidney disease due to Lyme because the prognosis once you get kidney disease with Lyme is, is generally poor and I haven't, got, I haven't gotten them in time um, or they haven't been sent to me in time. I have worked with Lyme in several dogs um, that are not in kidney failure yet. Um, and I have used some herbal, some herbal antibiotics in, in those dogs. Um, uh, or, Oregon grape, a grapefruit is one that can be used in that situation. Um, but a lot of that is going to be, you just do the usual. If you just do nutrition response testing on them, and it's going to come up with whatever you need to deal with. So gotcha. if the kidneys test, the kidneys are going to need whatever they need, right? So if you get a bacterial challenge on them, then they're going to test for whatever you need to address the bacterial challenge that are within your bacterial supplements, whatever your supplements are for immune system. But Lyme disease is really an immune system um, disease more so than a bacterial disease. It's, it's the body's response to the bacteria that you need to address. Gotcha. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we are getting short on time, um, but rather than go back to the PowerPoint, uh, I would actually love if you would uh, share the case study of motor uh, that you okay. told me about. Oh, because uh, okay. I saw motor today. Um, oh, did you really? Yes. So, <laughs> um, Motor first came to see me five years ago. He was a 16-year-old cat in renal failure, and the owner found my name. The owner drives two hours to come see me. She lives on the other side of the state. She found my name on the standard process website, and she her vet had put her cat on CD, which is um, a, a diet for um, renal failure in cats, and she just read the ingredients and didn't think that was right. She, so she was looking for somebody to guide her um, in in helping her cat to not die from renal disease. So the average cat dies from renal disease within two years of diagnosis, and um, and he was already 16 years old. So, so she came to see me, right, right. So. Um, she came to see me and brought blood work, previous blood work. Um, his BUN was, I believe, 45 at about, it was in the mid 40s at that time. And his creatinine was, I believe, 2.9. It was a little elevated. And um, we put him on, we put him on a raw food diet, which a lot of people would really freak out about because it's very high in protein and nobody wants high protein for kidneys. But in fact, there's not really research showing that that restricting protein is helpful in renal disease. Restricting phosphorus is helpful in, in kidney disease, which all of those foods are also restricted in phosphorus. Um, but we put him on a whole food diet. As a matter of fact, Motor loves shrimp and fish. So Motor eats a lot of shrimp and fish. And um, 
And over the next couple of years, um, he went through a bunch of renal supplements and he, he essentially, he went up about, in B, his B1 went up somewhere between two and five points a year. Um, Motor is now 21 years old. Like I said, I saw him today, he's 21. So he's been in renal failure for five years now. His, his BUN in that time period went from that mid 40s to he is now about mid 60s. Um, and his creatinine is uh, in the, about the same. Um, and he, he goes outside and hunts on a regular basis. And he has a great quality of life. You would, if looking at him, you would never think that he was a 21 year old cat. I mean, we see 21 year old cats, but they're usually like bony things with, they're not grooming, their hair coat's horrible. So he's actually the cat in the opening slide that when, when, um, when Adam first put up the very beginning. Yeah, so that's Motor right there. Right here. So, and again, we saw him today and he's, he's still doing great. The owner said he's, he's been voraciously hunting recently, so. Awesome. I wanted you to share that one because when we were down in West Palm Beach at the, uh, the the conference, the that story just blew my mind. Um, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I was younger, I had a cat look very much like Motor uh, who had uh, renal failure and, uh, you know, he died within like a year and a half or something like that. Yeah. And, and then you were telling me that he's been in renal failure for five years. And yeah. I was, I, I couldn't believe that that's a 21 year old cat in that picture. I mean, that does not look like a 21 year old cat. And, and yeah. that in and of it, itself is just testament to how powerful nutrition yeah. is. I actually is. have yet to lose a cat to renal failure. I think that's true, isn't it? Yeah, I've yet to lose a cat to renal failure that I've that I have done either nutrition response testing. And one of them, I just changed their diet to a raw food diet again, which most of our profession would be like, you can't do that. That's a high protein diet. Um, but it's it's biologically appropriate for them to eat a lot of protein, and and the the water content is so important in a fresh food diet for a cat. They are desert animals. They do not drink water, or they're not they're not good at it um they're supposed to get their hydration through their food and so wow. moving them to that. fresh foods and and especially hydrated hydrating fresh foods is so good for their kidneys so awesome. yeah i i have several old cats um who've been in renal failure now for for quite some time if the owner's willing to change the diet to fresh foods and um and we've but Motor's my oldest. I think he's been in renal failure the longest. <laughs> oh, my kitties. That's awesome. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that came in real quick. Uh, follow up on the Lyme's question is, uh, what do you suggest for a diet for an animal with Lyme's? I, I don't make different suggestions based on Lyme disease. I would put that dog on a, a fresh food diet if they can handle it. Occasionally, I have a dog who can't handle it. But again, we're working on the immune system of that dog. It's it's an inappropriate immune response with Lyme disease. And so we need to make sure that we get the microbiome in as good of shape as we can. And the way to best enhance the microbiome is to feed it appropriately. Gotcha. So, so I'm, always, I'm always looking to try to put an animal on a whole foods, minimally processed diet. Awesome. And, and some, so, there's a bunch of them commercially now. You don't even need to talk people into doing homemade diets. Yeah. Um, so I know with uh, humans, it's a, uh, it's actually approximately 70% of a human's immune system is located in their gut. Is that the same with animals? Yes. Yes. In, in the oh. your first line of protection is your microbiome. Let's actually, can we look at Bailey? Let's look at Bailey because of the um, the case study, because of the importance of the base diet in Bailey. Okay, so Bailey, five-year-old spayed female lab mix. Um, she first came to me in 2017. She is still she is still my patient and she is still alive. Um, 
and she is 10 now. So um, this is a dog that we did nutrition response testing on and she came with epidermal cholerates all over her body. Owner said she was, we put her on prednisone and, and antibiotics and it goes away, but within two weeks, she's got it back, right? So as long as they kept her on a steroid and an antibiotic, she didn't have a rash, but they didn't want her on a steroid and an antibiotic for the rest of her life when she was five years old. So um, I worked on this dog for three years trying to get rid of its rash and I couldn't, because we did, I got the owner in the beginning to move to a brain-free kibble, but she wouldn't leave kibble. Mm -hmm. So um, finally, and we went through all of my advanced clinical training knowledge. <laughs> we went through allergy clearing. We went through, um, hidden hyperorgan testing. We went through resonance testing. We went through everything on this dog and I could make her better, but I couldn't completely resolve her. I couldn't, I couldn't get rid of everything. So then I went to um, the Western Veterinary Conference uh, one year and I talked to the people at Primal. Primal Dog Food Company um, makes raw food. And they told me that they accepted case study that they were looking for case studies would I do some case studies for them they would give the owner free food for um, about three months if if they would if I would take pictures and document everything and um, send them updates every two weeks which she was already coming in regularly for me to try to solve her rash problem anyway so when I got them a free raw food diet for three months they were willing to do it mm -hmm. so in the, but this is really important is in the beginning she got worse so as we were killing off so when we changed her diet we were starving the bad bacteria in her gut so we were getting rid of the bad bacteria in her gut and those toxins were leaking into her system and and so about three weeks in she had more rash she was getting more rash she was getting worse and um, that's where nutrition response testing came in is I had to try to, I had to try to drain her. She was lots of drainage. She was just testing for lots of drainage. So in trying to control that situation, um, that's where we were using nutrition response testing. But in that three month period, the dog came down to almost no rash at all. And then, um, within six months, I think that's where my pictures are, uh, five months, my pictures are from five months. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, they deleted all my pictures on the iPad from my pre pictures. So I couldn't, I couldn't, but she we, was we do have the afters. Though. <laughs> <laughs> so this is her um, five months later, after having started a raw food diet, where she was like, her whole belly was red and flaky with, you know, rash. And in her, especially her flank area, she was bald all over in her flank area. And on her legs, she had little round circles of the skin infection all over her legs. Um, and you can see, she looks like a normal dog here. She had, she has hair again and, and no rash. And, and this is from 2018 to, yes. So this is, no, 2019. So this is from December of 2019. And she still has no rash. As a matter of fact, I see, I now see this dog when I was seeing her, I don't know, every two weeks. I was seeing her regularly for years. I now see her every three months just to make sure that nothing's going wrong. And she still looks like this. She looks great. And she's 10 now when she was five when she had major issues. But in this case, we had to change the base diet. I mean, the base diet was the thing that we had to change in order to make her better. We, mm -hmm. we couldn't overcome, you, you, there's no amount of, of supplementation that overcomes a bad diet. I was just going to say that. In the microbiome, from the standpoint of the microbiome, you're feeding the microbiome. And when you have a bad microbiome, it's not just a matter of getting the right nutrition in, it's a matter of getting rid of that, that, those toxic bacteria. Or, or fungus, or viruses, or whatever those toxic microbiome organisms are. Awesome. 
Well, thank you for sharing that uh, case study. I want to get to a few of these last questions that have come in because they're still coming in. Um, because this all ties into, you know, um, even what we were discussing at symposium this past uh, weekend of do the usual, do the nutritional response testing, utilize all of your tools and diet. Diet is the most but the most important factor in all of this. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Just because it's so. a dog doesn't mean you can't not change their diet. The best part about this is if you can convince the owner, you don't have to keep a food log and change it. You can do, you know, it doesn't have to be, the gradient has to be done as to what the owner is willing to do, right? That's your gradient. Yeah. And for the dog, they're gonna eat what the owner feeds them. So from that standpoint, you have to figure out the, the owner's gradient. And, and I don't always ask an owner to go right to a homemade diet because it's something that not every owner is willing to do or can do, either financially or time-wise or whatever it is. But over the years, I did get these owners there mm -hmm. eventually. Awesome. Uh, quick question from Larry Blanchard is, do you use uh, PEMF? on your animals um i don't i i do a lot of laser therapy mm -hmm. but i do not use pemf but you can that doesn't mean you can't yeah no i've seen a lot of animals um recover really well with uh pemf therapy um in fact uh one of our practitioners up in kentucky she bought uh one of the pemf mats that i carry i think it was telling you this in west palm beach but um she would lay the mat out and turn it on. She's got three golden labs and they would all pile on the mat and she could never get on the PEMF mat because the labs would just pile That's on it, it and, and take up the whole time. She actually had to buy a second mat for her, turn the one on for the dogs, let them all pile onto the mat and then she could actually use the PEMF mat itself. I mean, yeah. dogs and cats gravitate toward the things what they, they know innately is going to do good for them yes <laughs> and then um next question is from jody england this one's a little bit longer uh she says if your cat drinks a lot of water is that a warning sign to watch the kidneys and pancreas uh my cat will eat some raw but he can be <laughs> <laughs> uh, he can be difficult. I'm not. I don't think I could say that, Jody. Uh, and just walks away from it. Uh, he ate tuna for a long time, but I have to give him Kirkland tuna because the others had mercury in them, and he would eat them, and his eyes would turn red. Uh, and she can Let's see. Um. Sorry, I have to backtrack. My screen was cut off and I couldn't see the entire question. Um, he loves his kibble and just uh, started eating raw when uh, he saw the dog doing it. Um, yeah, so I guess two questions there. Um, if your cat's drinking a lot of water, should you be watching their... Yes, cats drinking. don't drink a lot of water. So there's a reason your cat's drinking a lot of water. And, and the the most common reasons are kidney disease, um, thyroid disease, or um, diabetes. Gotcha. All right, and then Dr. Cameron has another question. Um, he says, good job, Doc. Do you remember what motor's phosphorus level was? His phosphorus was always normal. Cool. And then Jody, uh, if you're looking for an NRT practitioner um, for a vet, just call the main UNS number and talk to reception and she'll be able to tell you uh, who's close to you. So, well, There's not many of us though. That's why we're trying to get more. Absolutely. So I was just going to say, if you guys know any vets that are holistically minded and want to get the results like what Dr. Rachel was discussing today, what Dr. Cameron has discussed in past uh, webinars that we've done, get them in touch with us because we need vets you know that uh our pets are a huge part of our lives you know and and they deserve to be taken as well care of as we are 
So just my plug for getting more vets trained. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, um, we, uh, we have actually gone way over what I was planning on going, but I love the questions. I love the fact that you guys were so interested in what we had to say today. Um, there was one case study we didn't get to because, you know, I, I, I had to ask about motor because that was just, that one was the most incredible uh, study for me. So that being said, um, next week, uh, we are going to be doing a webinar with Dr. Jared Bergman. And uh, for those of you who are at symposium um, or have been seeing the emails that have been sent out, he is the founder of Hedron Life Source, and that is the new uh, PEMF protection devices that uh, we're carrying. And he's going to be getting into the science behind it. And we're actually going to do this in a patient friendly manner. So if you guys want to uh, be able to take this webinar after we're done and show it to your patients so that they understand uh, the uh, EMF protection devices that we have, um, all the more power to you guys. Dr. Rachel, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your day. Uh, I know you have an incredibly busy schedule, and mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I was thrilled when we could uh, sit down and do the webinar with you today. Any, any closing What's advice for everybody? What's that? Any closing advice for everybody? Um, I would just say, if you want to test your pets, or you want to the, the best way to become good at that kind of thing is to practice. Practice awesome. makes you better at everything. So with that, there was a, a statement that was made by uh, a coach in the NFL. You know, an amateur practices until he never gets it, uh, until he gets it right. A professional practices until he never gets it wrong. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you guys again for joining us this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the webinar um, and I hope you look forward to it because this is uh, this is the format of webinar that we're going to try to go to to get you guys more information that you can use in your practices. So we will see you guys next week. Dr. Rachel, enjoy yourself and uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thank <laughs> you.